bow your heads as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, once again, it's a privilege to be in your house this Lord's Day as we worship you and as we just seek to exalt the name of Jesus. Father, it's our prayer this morning uh, that you would receive the worship that's being offered up to you as a sweet smelling aroma. And Lord, may we come before you with clean hands and a pure heart. Father, forgive us where we fail you. Forgive us of our sins. And Lord, draw us close to you. And Lord, as our eyes are going to be focused and fixed upon you, bring transformation in our lives. Mold us and shape us into the image of your Son. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, if you go ahead and pull them out, we're going to be in the book of James as we're continuing our walk through this great uh, little epistle. And as you can see, the sermon title three simple steps for spiritual growth. Uh, They are simple, I promise. They are very simple, but they're pretty hard to to practice on a regular basis. And so uh, we're going to need a lot of help from the Holy Spirit to to pull this one off um, with whatever it is that you may be walking through. And so hopefully you found your place, James uh, chapter 1, as we we walk through this uh, together. So James is probably the first book letter that's penned in the New Testament. Uh, James is the half-brother of the Lord, as we've said each week. Uh, He was the uh, shepherd at the church in Jerusalem, the first church. And as a church uh, scattered because of persecution, uh, this letter is written uh, to his congregants that are scattered abroad. Um, So this is a very practical book. Uh, James is writing uh, this letter because he's, he's wanting to encourage them in the midst of their trials and their tribulations, and he's wanting them to just remain faithful to the Lord. And so this book is extremely practical, extremely practical, probably written somewhere in the the 40s, Um, so not too long after the resurrection and the ascension, uh, James writes this letter to encourage those that are going through fiery trials. And one of the things that we've learned as we've been in this epistle is that trials, and we know this just from reality, either we're in one, we're coming out of one, or we're going to be going in one. It's just a part of life. And God uses these difficult seasons of life to to grow us and to refine us. We typically don't grow in mountaintop experiences. It's in it's in the refining fires that we have to look to Jesus and really rely on him more than what we've ever had. And, And James says that when we go through these that we're to count it all joy, consider it joy. Um, and in that, that's what the Lord produces in our life as we look to Him. We can't muster up this joy, but as we look to God and we lean on God, and as we lean into whatever it is that we're walking through, uh, God will produce joy in our life. And, and, and if you have joy, it's because you're walking with the Lord. He gives you joy and He gives you peace. And so we've looked at the different things that James has said in his introductory in the first 18 verses of how we are to to respond in the midst of trials. And if you were here last week, one of the things that we learned is that our biggest issue is ourselves. When we really look at our own hearts and our own sinfulness, that when trials come and and tribulations, that our our own flesh will lead us into temptation and entice us to handle and do things that are not befitting of God. And so when James gets to verse 19 and 20, and you could probably outline the book of James with verse 19, he really gives three crucial areas that we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to master in our life. And it will be an ongoing battle that we'll fight all of our lives, but we have to have some intentionality or give some intentionality to these areas that we can grow spiritually. Because really, these are the three qualities you need to be able to to endure, for you to be able to pass or to um, become the spiritual man or woman that God wants you to be, for you to have the qualities you need to be victorious in whatever it is that you're walking through. And this is not just true for trials and tribulations. These three qualities need to be a part of our life, no matter what season of life we're in. So you ready for them? They're simple. Let me read verses 19 and 20, and then I'll give you the three points, and then we'll walk back through it um, together. So then... My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And then verse 20, he says, For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So three simple 
steps that we are called to take, and it's an ongoing process that we need to continue to refine and grow in, are these three things. And I think we really need to have these etched in our mind. Number one, that we need to learn to listen more. Learn to listen more. Number two, we need to learn to talk less. Some more than others. And I'm in that camp of some. <laughs> Thirdly, we need to learn to calm down. Just calm down. Take a deep breath. So how do we grow? What qualities do we need to be victorious in what we're walking through? We got to learn to listen more. We need to learn to talk less. We learn to just need to we need to learn just to take a deep breath and calm down. Just relax. Don't be overwhelmed by your emotions. And so we're going we're gonna to dissect these three things for a few moments and just kind of, kind of camp here. And so I was telling Stan, I said, one of the things that God's really been convicting me with my preaching is that I just want to drill down and get as specific as I can in any message that I preach in where God's just really honing in on my heart with that. Because when you walk away, I, I want you to be able to walk away and say, okay, we, we've worshipped, what am I taking with me? And what you're going to take with you today, hopefully, is that you need to learn to listen more, talk less, and calm down. And if you'll do those three things, and you aren't going to be able to do them, by the way, in and of yourself. They're simple, they're practical, but you need the help of the Holy Spirit. I need the help of the Holy Spirit. But if we will work on our communication skills, and by the way, if I'm doing any type of uh, marriage counseling or premarital counseling, we're dealing with conflict management, guess what we're talking about? The reason there's going to be anger and strife is because you don't communicate well, and it's either you don't listen well, and you talk too much, or you need to learn in that the other person to get your emotions out and uh, to be able to, to do a better job of hearing what the other person is saying. So th this is just so practical. So listen more, talk less, calm down. And so in this, James is ultimately talking about us being able to hear from God. You go through a trial, you go through a tribulation, what do you want? What do you need? You need, you need a word from God. And I get that, that we're in a culture when people talk about God speaking to you, people get all out in crazyville on, on, on all different sides. But here's the thing, God does speak. He speaks through his word, he speaks through his spirit. You know, Jesus said, I'm going to go that I may send the helper, the counselor. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And God desires to give us a word. And his word is through his written word. And, and he wants us to... To, to hear it in the early church if, if they were going to study the scriptures they didn't have a bible on their app they, uh, an app with the bible on it they, they didn't have a hard copy that they would take home it, they would have to go to church and in a gathering hear the word preached or taught and in that they would have to memorize it and then meditate on it and man when they did that what they did is they were honing in and they were developing their listening skills and having good listening skills and, and meditating and memorizing the word, the word of God really set them up to be able to hear and have a word from God. And James is writing this. He says, listen, you need to be swift to hear. So my question to you this morning, how well are you when it comes to your listening skills? Because if you're like most within our society, it's probably not good at all. And I think the reason that, that we struggle so much in this is because we're just always distracted. There's always noise. There's always something going on. And there's so much information there. We've been saying for the long, longest time that we're in the information age. Technology and information is literally doubling every 12 months. It's, it's, it's that fast. And we're just bombarded. We, we, I mean, we, we don't know what to do. We'll just Google it, right? We'll just look it up. We'll watch YouTube. We'll see a video. Even when we pull back and we say, hey, we're just going to check, check out and, and, and just get, you know, compose our thoughts, so to speak. What do we do? We either turn some type of device on TV, which a lot of people don't even watch TV anymore. It's in their hands. And when it, when you, what's in your hands is your phone. And for many people, they're just looking at reels and they're just kind of going through it. And you're not even really taking in what you're watching or what you're listening to. It's just a mindless, almost like a robot. You're just going through a routine. And so we can't operate in that type of world that we're constantly distracted and think that we're going to really hear from God and also be able to really listen and he'll hear well from each other. And so this message may be more timely for our generation and our time than even what it was in James's time. And while we have so much more technology, this technology and these blessings 
in a lot of ways have become tremendous hindrances to us from being able to really listen well. And so you have to, and I have to be very intentional. And saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to do whatever it takes to be a good listener. Certainly wanting to hear from God, but, but also being a, a better listener to, to my spouse and to my children, and to my friends and co or you know, work at your church or whatever it may be. I, I want to be a better listener. And so let me give you a, a real life uh, illustration that took place in the life of Jesus with two, of, um, two ladies that, that he cared deeply about. If you have your Bibles, you can look at Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 43. Uh, two. If you're familiar with the Bible, you know this story. It's about Martha and Mary. And so verse 38 says, and when it happened as they went, it says, excuse me, now it happened as they went, that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into his house. Lady, when you're welcoming someone in your house, you probably don't think like your, your husband thinks. Uh, average woman says, well, is my house clean? What, what do I got to do? And I got to lay the spread out. And you get anxious and overworked because you've got to make sure everything is just right. Where the average husband is like, quit stressing, it'll be okay, right? Um, so Martha is going to welcome, of all people, Jesus into her house, verse 30, 20, 39, excuse me. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So Mary chose not to serve. Martha chose to go in overdrive and try, overdrive trying to get everything right. Verse 40 tells us that, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So notice that she's distracted. She's doing a good thing. She, she's serving. She's serving Jesus and those that are with him. She, she's serving away. I mean, she's, she's being a good servant, a faithful servant. But she's distracted and Jesus is talking and she don't know what he's talking. Why? Because she's so concerned, not only about what needs to be done, but she's equally concerned about who's not helping her out. You know, some of us, we don't slow down long enough to hear Jesus. But equally, we're so concerned about what somebody else is doing or what's going on in their lives that it's got us sideways instead of just really accepting where God's got us. And saying, God, I, I just need to hear a word from you. And so verse 41 tells us that Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. So if you know he's saying her name twice, there's some emphasis. <laughs> you are worried and troubled about many things. I wonder this morning how many of you are worried and troubled about things that, that God's never called you to, to worry and be troubled about. If you're carrying a load that, that isn't a load that God's asked you to carry, but because you like to be in control and you want things to be done right, you've just taken it upon yourself. Here's one of the things that I've had to learn the hard way. You know what I'm in control of? Pretty much nothing. Absolutely nothing. I mean, there's things we're to do. But at the end of the day, don't we have to rest in who God is and, and, and that he's the one that's ultimately in control? Amen. Look at verse 42. It says, but one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the good thing, the good part, which is not to be taken away from her. She chose to sit at the feet of Jesus. Let me ask you something this morning. What is it that's overwhelming you, that's distracting you from quieting your heart and really getting alone and listening to where you can hear from God. Because you can be doing some really good things. Martha was doing some good things, but she wasn't doing the best thing. I heard this statement this week, and I thought it was pretty powerful, so I want to say it to you this morning. I didn't, it didn't originate with me, so don't be tying my name to it as a quote. But I think it's pretty pretty good and it's something that we need to hear as a church don't be such a faithful servant that you become a disobedient disciple don't become such a faithful servant that you become a disobedient disciple so what does that mean you can get busy going and doing a lot of good stuff stuff that the Lord doesn't even ask you to do but you're not taking care of what's most important and that's your personal walk with Jesus Christ. 
You can't output more than you input. You can't give more than you take. I mean, you can't give more than what's, what's been given to you. And so we have to learn to listen more. Learn to, to, to sit back and, and to, to, to be with the Lord and, and hear what he has to say. And it's not just listening to the Lord. This is equally true in our relationships with one another. Now the context is speaking of hearing from God and the word of God. But the application is, is equally true. Most conflict in our life is because we don't listen well. Matter of fact, if you were to go to a counselor... What do they typically do? Ask questions and listen. Ask questions and listen. And if you go to one that are, they're doing more talking than what you are, you need to find a new counselor. Because what they're doing is they're, they're, they're hearing what you have to say and then helping you think through those whatever it is that you're walking through. Some of us, we do so much uh, talking that, that we don't listen. And even when we're listening, we're so distracted and we're so... You know, so quick to want to give the answer, so quick to want to be heard that we're not really hearing one another, validating one another. One of the things that I've learned that those that are quiet, that if you'll ask a question and simply give time for them to respond, they will. It just takes some time. There's nothing wrong. Even in our interpersonal relationships with there being a little bit of silence. We're, we're so accustomed where we've constantly got to have noise. We've got, constantly got to have something. It's got to be wide open instead of just, just silence. Just learning to listen. Learning to take in. It's not by accident that most people that have the gift of discernment are those that do the least talking. Because if you are a big talker and you walk into a room, you're too busy talking and trying to conquer the room than you really are of taking in and, and, and measuring up and seeing what, what's before you and observing. You're more interested about being heard than you are in listening. And I'm just telling you that from my own experience that if we'll grow in the area of listening to what those that are saying around us are saying, that the amount of conflict would go down in our life tremendously. For the talkers that are in here, and you know what I mean when I say talkers, you say, how do I know that I'm the talker in my relationship? When you ride down the road with your wife, who carries 90% of the conversation? For whoever, you're the talker. And so what you have to do is you have to learn to listen. You say, man, I just wish my spouse would talk more, but then you've got to hush. Honestly, you just got to, and it's one of the things that, and I'm, I'm the talker in, in, our, in our relation. We're riding on the road, and I literally did this as we were coming back from Greensboro this week, is, is that I, I felt myself, and I was just, just going on and on for about five minutes, and I said, you know what, I'm going to ask this one more question, and I'm just going to hush, and I'm just, I'm just going to hush. And that was just self-awareness. And then there was some moments of there was just quietness between Shannon and I, and then sooner or later, it just started coming out, and she just started talking, and then I was able to listen and process. But if I'd have never shut up, She'd have never talked. And if we don't learn to listen, then one, we don't really hear from God, and two, we don't really hear from those that we care the most about. And so if we're going to have the qualities that we need, three, step, three simple steps of growth, we've got to learn to be a better listener. God, help me learn to listen, to take in, to receive. In the natural... The opposite of that is to talk, talk less, right? Proverbs 13, 3, uh, and James is going to talk a lot about the tongue, but, but just learning to, to talk less, it says, he who guards his mouth preserves his life. You know, what happens is that when you're going through trials, you're, you're so bewildered and you're so shook up, you're not receiving because you're not listening, and then you're just talking, and as you're talking, you're typically talking about someone, and it's probably slander, and then how does that make you feel? Right? It just makes you feel worse. And, and what's really interesting, and we're going to see this in a few moments, it's like the more you talk about it, the, the, the greater your, your anger and frustration grows. It, it just fascinates me that somebody can absolutely be calm, cool, and collect, and then all of a sudden they're talking about someone they're struggling with, and the more they talk, the more their face turns red and their blood pressure goes up because they, are as, as they just become hot because of the fact that they're talking about it. Some of you, I think the reason God hasn't removed some of the, the problem people that may be in your life that you're struggling with, why he hasn't given you victory over it, is because you just talk too much about it. 
You, you don't give it to God. So how do you know you give it to God when you quit talking about it? How do you know you give it to God when that person's name comes up and it doesn't have to be negative? Or negative reaction? He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens his lips shall have destruction. Here's another great quote, and this quote came from Elizabeth Elliot, and I think it's fascinating and very convicting. She says, never pass up the opportunity to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> There's a lot of wisdom there. If you're that person that input in, input out, then you're going to have a lot of hardship and heartache in your life. Proverbs 10.19, and there, there's a lot of Proverbs that, that speak about the tongue, but Proverbs 10.19, it says, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. You talk a lot, you sin a lot. And that's just reality. How many times have you walked into a conversation or a situation, you said, I'm not going to talk about it, I'm not going to bring it up, and then you walk away and you're like, why did I just do what I just did? I'm not going to go there, but you end up going there. Proverbs 17, 28 says this. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. You know, you can at least, I can at least play the part of being a wise man or woman if we just don't talk. <laughs> but when we open our mouths, I mean, there's no more hiding, right? How many times have you seen someone, you're like, man, I think that's a, that's a pretty smart, smart person. All of a sudden you hear them talk, you're like, okay, I was wrong on that. You know, at the very least, you can, you can pretend to be wise by just not saying anything. You're not going to talk your way to health. And I get that there's times that, that you've got to process some things and you need to walk with a close friend and you need to be able to get those out and you need to be heard. It needs to be viol um, validated. I get that. But the problem is that if that's all we do, is that we're wide open, we're never listening, and we're always talking then we're, going, we're, we're, we're not going to be victorious in our walk. You ever been around that person or been that person that when you're talking to someone, you, you know that they're not lis listening to you because they're more interested in, uh, in, in answering and, and, and giving a word back? You know, what I've come to learn is listeners are, are typically growers. They're growing because they're taking in. But the talkers that go overboard with talking, they, they think they're pretty smart because they've always got something. We, not they, we always think we got something we got to share, something we got to give. We got a word, we got a word, we got a word. And maybe we have a word, but we don't have a word all the time for every situation, for every circumstance. Sometimes it's just good just to be quiet and come alongside and walk with people. And so James says, listen more, talk less. And then thirdly, just calm down. Calm down. Because you know what happens is when, when, it, when you're not listening and you don't have cl uh, real clarity on what's going on, and you're just running off at the mouth and it's making it worse, then, then your emotions are all over the place. And when your emotions are all over the place, then you end up allowing your emotions to lead you. And I, and I can tell you this, when you're led by your emotions, it's going to be like a roller coaster. You're, you're going to be all over the place. You're going to, you're going to become the rage monster, right? The, the, it's going to get to the point where you're just going to lose it. And we've all been there. And there's shame that we carry when we do that. And here's what, what I know, and, and the Scripture tells us this in verse 20. It says that the, the wrath of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Have you ever been going through something and you just, you just lost it? Right? The anger is just over it, and you just lost it, and you blew yourself. Did you, did you see positive transformation, or, or, or did something good come out of that? I, I've never lost my cool and said things that I ended up regretting saying and seeing it work for the good. I mean, I get that there's moments you've got to have some hard conversations, but even at that, you've you got to do it under the control and power of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that I've often said before you, that if you are angry and, and your emotion is high and you're running to it, that's your telltale sign that that's not the Holy Spirit and God leading you there. If you are frustrated and you know it's got to be dealt with, but you, you are not wanting to do it and you're having avoidance in it, but God's pressing you, so you've got to have that conversation and you're saying, Lord, help me. That's a sign that God may be very well leading you down that path to have a hard conversation, but you're doing it in fear and trembling. 
It says, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so why do we lash out? Why do we, we lose our cool? Why do we get so angry? Well, hurt people hurt people. And most of our anger comes from hurt. People have done us wrong. They've said things. They've, they've um, mistreated us. They, you know, whatever it may be. So how do you overcome that? Well, I'll remind you that, that God's called us to give grace. And you can't give grace to someone or, uh, if you haven't received it. So when Jesus gives us the model of prayer and he, and, and he teaches us to pray, Lord, forgive me of my sin, as I forgive those that sinned against me. Listen, you can't give forgiveness if you haven't received it. And if you are at a point to where rage and, and anger is controlling you, and by the way, you can be a stewer or a spewer. Because sooner or later, it's all coming out. I mean, there's people that, that may hold it in, but they're just walking around with so much venom and so much anger. I mean, they're just wasting away. And that's not the right response. And it also means you, you probably haven't listened well and heard a word from God to, for him to, to show you he's got you and he's walking through this with you. You're probably talking about it too much, and as you do, your emotions are overwhelming you. So why do we, we get to that point? It's, it's typically because of hurt or some type of anxiety. I'll never forget when we were, I was a youth pastor, and we were, I was in my early 20s, and we took a, a big group of us uh, up to Carowinds, and I had several husbands and wives that chose to, to drive, and so we didn't like rent a bus or a van. We just piled up in a bunch of cars, and, and we got into a lot of traffic in, 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 as we were going into Charlotte. And uh, I'll never forget when we came to the gas station, because everybody was just, it was, it was rough, and we pulled into the gas station. And as we pulled into the gas station, every single husband that got out of that car had smoke coming out of his ears because they were as mad as could be because their wife, was giving them a fit, our wives <laughs> were giving us a fit over our driving. How many times, especially early on in marriage, did you go on a, a vacation and before you, you got too far, it was, it was already World War III because of the driving that was taking place? You know what I've learned? Is that people that struggle with anxiety typically snap at people when they get nervous. And you know what was happening that day? There was a lot of women that were scared by the way their husbands were driving. <laughs> and they were snapping. And you know what happens is that our emotions control us. And it ends up taking us places that we never want to go. Because we're being emotionally led and flesh led instead of spirit led. So when James says, listen, you need to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Because these are the qualities that you need to grow through in, in what you're growing, going through. This is what you need. These are fundamental. Listen more, talk less. Just calm down. Take a deep breath. Because if you handle it in your own strength, it's going to go from bad to worse. You're not going to see the fruit that you're desiring to see. Now, I don't know if that applies to anybody here, but it applies to me this morning. And it's certainly convicting. And also know that I don't have the skill set or the discipline in and of myself to say, you know what, I'm just going to become a better listener. I'm going to learn to keep my mouth shut. And I'm going to control my emotions. No, it's the command. I'm called to, to put energy and effort to that. And God doesn't command or call us to do something that he doesn't, or at least not willing to come alongside and produce that type of, of fruit in our lives. But we have to be willing participants. When Israel... Would, would go to God and they would inquire of the Lord about going to battle with some pagan nation. They would always ask, Lord, is this your will? And God said, it was, I've already given you the victory. But you know what? They still had to go out and fight the battle. And I just want you to know this morning, God wants to give you victory in these areas, but you've got to be willing to, to pick up your sword and be willing to slay the sin that's in your life. And what I mean by that is saying, God, I see it as you see it, I call as you call it, and I'm asking you to do a work in me that you would fill me with your spirit, that I would do a better job of consistently meeting with you and hearing from you. And not just hearing from you, but listening and caring better for those that are around me. Equally, Father, I'm asking that you would help me with my tongue and with my speech. Make me aware when I'm saying things that are not befitting as a child of God. Let the Holy Spirit send the alarms off in my spirit and saying it's time to hush, it's time to hush, it's time to hush. And Lord, in all of this, give me self-control where I can be led by your spirit 
and not by my flesh. And so I give this passage of scripture to you and you know it all too well. But it's Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God desires to give us what we need to be victorious. But you know why, in our trials, but you know why we don't typically have, have them? It's because we're more interested in God removing the trial than we are Him growing us. And so our prayers are typically, God, deal with that person. God, change that person's heart. God, move in this situation. It's not as much, God, fill me with your spirit and let your fruit be manifested in my life to where I can listen better, I can talk less, and my emotions can be under control and I can calm down and quit being so offended. Could it be that we haven't learned life, the life lessons that God's trying to teach us? of why some of the trials that we go through last a little bit longer than maybe what even God intended them for the last, to last. All I know is that James says these are the qualities, these are the things that you need to be victorious. This is what you need. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes as we bring this down for a landing. Father, as we come before you this morning in prayer and just crying out and just convicted through your spirit, Lord, of our own personal sin. Lord, it's easy to be overwhelmed with the shame of falling short in all three of these areas so often. And Lord, I am so thankful for 1 John 1, 9 that says that if we'll confess our sins, that you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, Father. For those that need to be in here, this morning crying out asking for forgiveness father I pray that in the quietness of their heart they would do that very thing and equally father for those that may be in here and they know good and well that they don't know you through your son Jesus Christ father I pray that the the first prayer that you want to hear them pray the first first step of obedience the first step that they need in their walk is to to come to the knowledge of of realizing that they need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior that we're all sinners and that our sin separates us from you and that Jesus came for the purpose to, to seek and save that which was lost. And Lord, that's what you meant when you said that God so loved the world that you gave your one and only Son that if we would believe in him, we would not perish but have everlasting life. Father, for the person that may be in here this morning that's never trusted Christ as their Savior, I pray that right now, at this moment, as the Holy Spirit's revealing their sin, their shortcoming, Equally, Lord, I pray that you would reveal that you love them unconditionally and that you're offering them to be a part of your family by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. As your word tells us that whoever would call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. Father, I thank you for your word. And now as we transition to this invitation, may we respond accordingly. And we pray this now in Christ's name. Amen.